uh, tweaking a couple things over here just to get you all nice and shiny and where I want you. If you see me looking off to my right, it's because that's where you all are for me. Um, but hello, uh, thank you for so much for having me. I'm really excited to give this talk. Um, this is something I care a lot about and I haven't really spoken much about it before. So uh, really excited for this opportunity. Uh, but this is an introduction to application architecture and scalability. Um, I'm Matt Eland. Uh, there are a couple things I want you to know about me. Uh, first, I have a wonderful wife, Heather, and a uh, noisy, cute, and adorable little terrier, Jester, uh, who are both upstairs as we, as we talk. Um, but secondly, I want you to know that I'm a software, uh, sorry, excuse me, I'm, <laughs> I'm an instructor at Tech Elevator. Uh, we are a 14-week programming boot camp uh, throughout, uh, really throughout Northeast uh, America, uh, but we are also virtual. We have remote campuses as well. Really everything right now is remote, um, but we're really uh, throughout the Northeast and growing, uh, including uh, in Philly. Uh, I actually have uh, Katie uh, Zyko here, who's our, uh, our campus director for our Philly campus, and uh, I'll introduce her again at the end of the talk, and she might want to say a few words. Um, but I'm, I'm honored to, to be here representing the organization. By the way, we do believe in Florida. I, this slide apparently is just missing it. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, some other things uh, for you to know about me and my background, because it is relevant for uh, today's talk. Um, I have spent probably the last 15, 20 years in the software as a service industry, uh, primarily working with organizations who are launching a product and delivering it to a small number of customers, selling it, and then adding new features, adding more customers uh, and scaling up. Uh, so startups that grow into more of the, the, the survival stage and the medium stage, uh, that's kind of been my thing. I've done a lot of that with uh, .NET technologies uh, as well as some JavaScript. Um, and I, I like it a lot, but uh, I like teaching uh, more. <laughs> and so I, last year I, I moved into instructing and uh, I, I haven't really looked back. Um, on the side, I do a number of things. I'm an organizer for Central Ohio.net developer group. I have a social project management application for developers working on side projects called SideDev. You can hit me up on Twitter if you're interested in that later. And I also write occasionally on software at killalldefects.com. I'll put some more links at the end uh, in closing if you're curious about any of these things. Uh, I like to say that I give three different types of talks. Uh, the first type of talk I do is really kind of an encouragement, motivational, like, yay, you can do this, you got this kind of a talk. The second type of talk I give is more of a lecture of, like, here's how you do X, whether that's writing unit tests in in-unit, or here's how you create a new uh, project in Vue.js, or uh, something like that. So really an in-depth technical, here's how you accomplish one or two different ta tasks. The third type of talk uh, that I like to give is really what I call a toolbox talk, where I am throwing a bunch of different little ideas at you uh, for you to get a kind of a surface understanding of so that you can look into more of, of this thing that you maybe didn't even know existed. Um, we're not getting deep into anything, but I'm, I'm throwing a lot of the things at you for you to look into later or for you to be a little bit more familiar with. And that's really kind of the goal of today's talk is I want you to be a little bit more familiar with some of the concepts around software architecture and application uh, scalability. Uh, I know we already stated this in the introduction, but please interrupt with questions. Uh, I'm used to, to being interrupted. I get paid to be interrupted by our students um, and I, I've come to enjoy it. But since we're talking about so many little things, it can be hard to keep all your questions for the end because you'll forget about them. So please, please, please interrupt. I swear I won't mind. Uh, and also I love the cute dog picture, so I couldn't resist. So uh, with that, uh, some goals for today. I want you to leave with a little bit more comfort uh, talking about software engineering concepts, talking about application architecture and scalability. I want you to have a little bit more awareness into some of the options, as well as what that, that growth uh, looks like for an organization as you're adding in more and more things uh, to, to help your application survive at scale. Um, but I also want you to be aware of some of the drawbacks that come as we add complexity to our applications. We'll talk more about this at the closing of today. Uh, but that's kind of my, my goal for you today is for you to have a little bit more awareness of some of these things, a little bit more comfort, comfort talking about it, um, understanding things that you read, uh, conversations you may encounter at work, uh, etc. So that's, that's, that's what I want you to get out of this talk. Uh, so we're going to start just with talking about some core high level concepts. 
And then we're going to dive into the meat of the talk, which is really just talking about scalability and taking a fictitious and, by the way, ridiculous application. And we're going to talk through how we might scale it up from the early startup stage to booming mega corporation stage. Um, we'll, we'll look at each area in depth uh, from the web server to the database to the APIs to the front end. And we'll close with some advanced concepts. Uh, we'll end with a brief um, recap and some recommendations, as well as some words of warning on some of the more advanced things. There's a natural tendency as you see all these new shiny tools to say, oh, oh my project needs to have this, even though it's going to serve um, information for about 10 people. Uh, and that's not always good, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So uh, with that, let's uh, kick things off by, by talking about some core concepts in application development, application scalability. Uh, I'm going to keep things high level. Uh, we're not going to be talking about specific applications or specific uh, technologies, um, but I want to focus just on applications as I built them when I when I was younger. Uh, this would be like a, a desktop application. We'd have a standalone application. Think about Minesweeper on your desktop, or Notepad, or um, the calculator on your phone. This is an application that you can use just fine without an internet connection. It's running locally. We call this a, a standalone application, single tier application, that kind of a thing. Nice and easy. Problem with this is you can't really share any information with anyone else. It's fine for a word processor. It's less fine for something that needs to communicate with, uh, with other people. And so what we did uh, long ago was we said, okay, well, let's deploy our application to everybody's desktop and they can all talk to the same database, the same database inside of our organization and so now you have a two-tier architecture where you have an application. Let me turn on my laser pointer over here because I love my bells and whistles. Um, so you have an application that's installed in somebody's machine and it's talking to a database server, which is maybe in some, some closet somewhere in your building. And you'd have a bunch of these little applications and they're all talking to the same data. Uh, and so uh, I could write some code and then uh, Katie over there in her office could see the same data because she was talking to the database server. Uh, and this was fine, uh, this was progress, um, and this is two-tiered architecture. But uh, probably about uh, 20 years ago or so, we, we shifted, maybe even further back than that, we shifted to more of a three-tier or an N-tier architecture approach, where we have an application of some form or another, it says web application here, it could be mobile, it could be desktop, it could be web, or something else, uh, and that talks to a, a server, some machine somewhere that's set up to get web service calls. So it says, hey, I want to talk to the server. I want to get information. And then that server talks directly to the, to the database. So the application is no, no longer talking directly to the database. It's talking to the server. And the server will, in turn, uh, talk to the database. We do this to keep um, more of our code in this one single place here instead of having our code in a web application and a mobile application and a desktop application. It's, it's uh, uh, less code duplication, which is always good. It's also more secure because the, because the individual applications don't talk directly to the database. And that's always better. Uh, so this is sort of an N-tier or three-tier architecture. We have a client, a server, and a database. And that's how a lot of us still think about applications. But that's starting to shift a little bit in the last few years, um, or a little bit longer than that. Uh, and that's kind of exciting. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about hosting. So when I started working uh, a couple decades ago, we, we thought about the server, we thought about one of these little machines sitting on a rack somewhere in a rack mount, maybe in a data center downtown, maybe in the end of the building, maybe somewhere else. And you'd write your code and you'd make a little server and you'd install it on, the, on this little piece of hardware. And that would handle all the requests. And then you might say, okay, well, I'm going to write another application. So you'd install another server blade somewhere, and that would run your, your code. And so anytime you needed a new server, you had to get another piece of hardware, or you had to install it on something else, which was already busy. Um, so you had this big capital expense uh, up front whenever you're trying to add something new. Um, that's kind of how we've thought about applications for a while. And then this, this idea came along of like virtualization. And I am not a virtualization expert. I'm not uh, really an IT expert at all, except for programming. Um, but this idea of virtualization was, was really, hey, let's have one big honking 
server, technical term, um, that runs some sort of a server operating system, it has something called a hypervisor, which I'm not going to get into because, well, we're not talking about that. Um, and and this, this server runs a number of virtual machines, and each one of these virtual machines is a separate operating system that's running all on the same server, and it's giving a portion of its memory, a portion of its computer processing resources to, to it, etc. And the, the idea here is that we can run an, an application here, and if we need another instance of it, we can, we can uh, just add it to the same server, share a little bit more of the resources for it like that. So we don't always have to buy another server, we can just add it to an existing uh, host. So that was sort of the idea with, with virtual machines. But then somebody came along and said, hey, you know what, there's some duplication going on. We got the, the operating system here, and we got an operating system here, and this might be the same operating system as this. I'm not so sure this makes sense. And so things like Docker and containers came along, and now we have the same big honking server, trademark, that runs, uh, that runs something, but instead of running hypervisor, it's now running Docker or some other containerization system. And all it has on that is an application and the dependencies of that application needs. So you have less duplication going on. Ultimately, less of the resources are going to supporting multiple operating systems. And you can just focus on running a lot of little applications. That's about the extent that I wanna talk about um, virtual machines and containers. Um, except to note that whenever I'm talking about a server from now on, I might be talking about a rack on a, on a server. I might be talking about a virtual machine. I might be talking about a container. It, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just some sort of an implementation detail, but I wanted to get that uh, out of the way up front before we got really into the, into the technical bits because it's relevant for some of these things. All right, so let's talk about scalability. And for the rest of this talk, we're going to be talking about a fictitious company uh, who I apologize in advance, uh, but we're calling it Bereddit because Reddit is all the rage right now. And I happen to be a Redditor myself. And so this is a clone of Reddit, but only for burrito related content. Anything else gets immediately deleted from the server. Horrible business model, but entertaining for a talk. And so they've managed to make it make an application. They, they have everything covered. And they're really investing in the marketing department. They're trying to scale up the number of users that they have. And now it's sort of our job as the engineers behind this thing to make it work. And so they start to actually succeed somehow. I don't know how, who signs up for a burrito related social media application, but they're starting to succeed. And as an organization grows from the early stage and they start to get multiple users using the system at the same time, you start to encounter performance issues. And so that can look like a number of different things and you 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 would you're you're familiar with what this looks like from using web applications yourself i'm sure but you see that your requests take a little longer or sometimes they they time out they don't work correctly sometimes you see obscure error messages or inconsistent results whenever you're loading loading your pages sometimes you can't even get access to the application because it's under too much load these are all common symptoms of high uh the, uh, high utilization and, and poor performance. Another metric which you may not think about is that if you're looking at like Google Analytics data that shows users and, and how they're using your system, you start to see some changing uh, per user metrics for this. And, and what I mean is you might see like individual users suddenly look more active, like, hey, we, we still have the same number of users, but now they're refreshing pages a lot more. They're going in, they're looking at a whole lot more pages. This is great. Well, maybe not because they're saying this isn't loading for me. I'm going to hit RIF5 and refresh my page. Oh, is it loading for you? I don't know. Let me check. And so you see this sort of a start, a, a spike in usage as performance issues come up, followed by this plunge in usage as people say, well, it's not working. I'm going to go uh, play ping pong or, or do my reports or whatever it might be. Um, and so uh, usage metrics changing unpredictably is actually a symptom of performance in some cases. Um, this is not a talk on really monitoring performance, but really adjusting for it. But one of the first things you should do is take a look at metrics related to your performance. And usually you'll use a tool um, like an application performance monitoring tool or APM tool. Uh, I have New Relic uh, pictured here because I've used that the most in my career. But this is a, a piece of software that you install on your web server and it watches incoming requests. It looks at the amount of throughput the server is handling, so the number of requests coming through in a given second. 
it looks at the average response time and it, it kind of charts this out over the course of the day. And you can look at it and you can say, okay, well, we're, our, our requests are starting to get a little slow around this, this time. And you can look at these little colors here and it's like, okay, well, this blue, well, that's that's .NET. So, okay, this is our web server and our yellow. Well, that's that's uh, that's our database. And you can see, okay, well, we're spending a lot of time in our code. So our web server is starting to get a little overwhelmed. And so you can use these, these APM tools to help you see, hey, this is, this is what's going on. We probably need to pay attention to the server. And you can take a look at what pages are the slowest uh, and what transactions are the slowest to kind of get an idea of if there's a specific area that's slow or it's just your entire application. Uh, so th this, that's a whole three or four or five other talks <laughs> just to get into to application performance monitoring. Um, but that really is what you want to do is you want to look and see what's actually slow. And it's worth paying for an APM solution, in my opinion, because otherwise you're not sure you're fixing the right thing. And that's never a good place to be in. But let's say that Beretta is has decided that they have uh, they have issues on their web server and they want to look at how they're going to scale their, their web server uh, or how, how they want to handle it. So there's a lot of a lot of ways we can fix these things. And usually as you're just starting out, you're starting out on the cheapest server you can afford. And typically the first time that you start seeing these performance issues is when you start looking at improving your, your web server. So here we have our, our, our application talking to the server, talking to the database. Well, it's probably time to scale up or vertically scale the web server, not into a, a larger case necessarily, but to something with a little bit more CPU, a little bit more memory, a little bit more power behind it. And so you, you scale vertically, you, you, you um, go to a, a, a more expensive server that can handle the requests coming through. And this is usually a good thing to do early on in, in an organization's uh, life cycle because it's a quick thing to do and it tends to last for a while. So first thing you often do is upgrade the web server or you scale it up, scale it vertically, and then it restores service, people are happy and you got more room for, for, for growth. And then time goes on and it happens again and you start looking at some numbers and you say, okay, well, last time when we upgraded our server, it, we had to jump from, from this to this on a monthly hosting cost. Next time we're gonna have to jump from this to this. Time after that, the next available one, you know, it, it starts to get a little out of control, your monthly spend and your business people start to frown a little bit more about that. And so this, this type of vertical scaling uh, ultimately doesn't work past a certain point because it becomes a little too expensive. There's another problem with it too. Uh, there is the, uh, the problem is that most systems, not all systems, but most systems see different usage during different hours. So most organizations are going to have peak hours, right, during the working day. So from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., you're going to have a lot more usage on your business systems than uh, in the off hours. And so you might need to build your system in such a way that it can handle the requests that it gets in the mid-afternoon when usage is the highest. Uh, plus a little buffer for growth, but you don't need the same scale of server to handle the requests you get at three in the morning, right? Uh, so you sort of have to, to pander for the, uh, the, the busiest usage times. And so if you're, if you're paying for, for hosting on, on a cloud, like a Azure or AWS or Google Cloud or something like that, you're paying for your really expensive server um, all the time because that's the one that can handle your peak times. And that's a problem. And so usually once you upgrade the server once or twice, you start to look at other options. And so instead of scaling vertically, uh, you now want to start scaling horizontally. And what scaling horizontally means is, is we're no longer going to have, you know, a big server that can handle things. We're going to have a few of them. So we're going to have a lot of little servers and each one of these servers is capable of handling requests. And we're going to have something called a load balancer. And what the load balancer does is, is your actual requests from your application go directly to the load balancer. Load balancer knows about all the servers in your application, in the, in the application pool. And it says, okay, well, I'm gonna look at my servers. I'm gonna see which ones look healthy and can accept this request. And it's gonna distribute these requests based on it, how, how it's, it's configured to operate. And it's gonna distribute them more or less evenly. And so now you no longer need a server that's really good to handle a lot of requests in a second. Now you need a, a number of little servers that can handle just a few requests. And 
this has some, some significant advantages too. Uh, there are some cautions here um, because you can't predict which application server is gonna handle a given request. That means that each server can't store anything about the last request it saw uh, because it may or may not have gotten a request from that user before. So things like cookies um, don't work as well. Your requests truly have to be uh, sort of stateless. Um, um, Matt, just a yes. couple of questions. Please. Um, could you talk about uh, round robin load balancing just a little bit? Um, I am not sure how deep my well of knowledge goes on this. Uh, okay. There are likely people it's here a, who are. <laughs> um, it's a pretty common term. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'll link it to the diagram. Yep, but uh, round robin is, is roughly, it's it's gonna go, a request is gonna go, the first request it sees is gonna go to app server one, second one's gonna go to app server two, third one's gonna go to app server three, and so forth until it reaches the end, in which case it loops back to the around to, to, the, to the first one. So it's gonna split them up as evenly as it can. Yeah, and that's usually the default. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you set up a load balancer? Well, the, I'm not a hardware person. Uh, the way I set up a, a, a load balancer is I tell uh, I tell Azure to do it for me uh, <laughs> because Azure has has nice little options of saying like Hey, do you want a load balancer for your application? Cool. Um, that, that's the extent to which I can answer that question, Alicia. My my knowledge is 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 fairly general in some of these areas. And so when you talk about vertical and horizontal scaling, mm -hmm. when you vertically scale, you add compute by adding more CPUs, adding yep. more RAM, or adding more disk. Um, but you have three servers here and you're saying that's horizontal scaling. Yep. How is this adding and removing compute? Well, that's lovely because that's my next slide. Uh, we call that term elasticity of being able to dynamically add and remove servers. So you take a look at that, that chart we saw earlier with the, the peak hours, right? When you have your peak at, at 3 p.m. and your trough at about 3 a.m. So. I do hate charts with uh, multiple vertical axes, but it's the best way to represent this data that I've found so far. So that's what I'm using here. So this orange bar is the number of servers that we have going on, and the blue is the number the number of requests. So most of the time we're at one request at one one active server, and then as usage starts to pick up, we say we can we've configured some rules that say, hey, when our servers are you know, at 70% utilized for 10 minutes, we need to add another server to the pool. And so it adds another one and then another one and then another one until it can handle the request and keep up with it. And as it gets these peaks, it starts to add in servers dynamically until it can keep up with the load. And then as things start to cool off again, it says, oh, okay, well, my servers are now underutilized. Let's take away a server and take away another one and another one. And the key here is that you're only paying for the servers when they're actually active. Uh, which is really cool and really cost effective. It does mean that you have to build your application in such a way that it can support a load balancer. Um, and it does mean that you have this kind of extra complexity going on, but you have the benefits of being able to use you know, a, maybe a lower tier of server and being able to you know, dynamically add and remove servers from, from your load balancer. Do you have to add and remove manually? Nope you can almost always uh, configure rules on whatever cloud hosting provider you're using. If you're not, if you're hosting it locally, I'm sure there's ways, but I've not gone down that rabbit hole myself. Um, especially if you're using virtualization, things like Docker, uh, Kubernetes, uh, they can, uh, sorry, containerization, not virtualization, <laughs> um, but, but uh, Kubernetes is really good at being able to dynamically add things to handle um, load as, as things come up. All very good questions. All right, so um, we've now managed to, to, to find some pretty good solutions for handling our server scalability. And Beretta is growing and people are liking it and it's creating more problems for us because the usage continues to grow. And so now we're gonna take a look, uh, not at the server, but at the database and see really kind of that next step in things. Uh, and this is like kind of the next step that organizations typically see. Uh, so let's talk about scaling our database. I'm gonna rewind a little bit to, to a slide that we saw earlier. And let's take a look at that load balancer slide again. So here's just a, an example of we're getting 43 requests into our application. They're going to the load balancer. They're getting distributed more or less evenly. Uh, and then each one of these requests is triggering a sequence of queries against your database. 
And well, there's a problem because you still only have one database server going on. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Uh, but we only have one database server going on and you still have that full volume of requests going into that into that server. So because of this, your server does start to get overwhelmed over time and you need to start to, to, to fix performance issues at the database level instead of at the application, the web application level. Again, your application performance monitoring tools, your database monitoring tools will help tell you when this is occurring. And the first step for this is the same as the first step uh, that we saw earlier with the uh, uh, with the application server. Is we scale vertically. We we increase the uh, the the CPU, the memory, and particularly the disk capabilities of our database server, and to a to a higher tier of a machine, so it can now keep up with the the activity going uh, coming its way. This is even more expensive than scaling the web server vertically, however, because not only do you have the memory and the CPU, but disk space and disk read write speed is, is uh, a lot more expensive uh, at the server because the more users you have, the more data you have to store. So the larger the drive you need, the more backups you need, uh, et cetera. And you need to, to have a, a disk that's as fast as it can possibly be. So you're looking at premium solid state drives and large premium solid state drives. And that gets that gets pretty expensive pretty quickly. And so once you start getting sustained uh, pressure on your database, sustained performance issues with your database, and it's no longer feasible to scale up the database, uh, you're usually forced to optimize your queries. So uh, when you only have 10 users a day running your, your application, it doesn't usually matter how slow your queries are. And for this reason, a lot of startups tend to have bad SQL in their applications and not realize it for a year or so, uh, maybe even longer, until the usage really takes off and the database uh, performance issues start to show up. So because of this, you start to need to spend, spend some serious time, serious development time, looking at your queries, figuring out what is slow, what operations are the slowest, what can we do to fix this, do we need some more indexes, do we need to change what our clustered index is, do we need to, to, to add a new table, um, and so you start to need to tweak these things over time and it, it takes away from your ability to add new features, uh, which is a shame because, you know, people like new burrito related features, apparently. So you're mentioning database server and query optimization. Is this true for NoSQL or document or column stores too? It's not as true for, for those. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about NoSQL in a minute. Uh, but for now, I'm talking about relational database management software uh, in particular. Uh, or RDMS, uh, such as SQL Server, MySQL, things like that. Uh, but NoSQL is actually a pretty good way to get around some of these limitations. We'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Uh, awesome questions as always. So you might look at this last slide and say, okay, well, we scaled up. So why can't we scale out? Why can't we have multiple uh, database servers going on? And don't, don't try this at home uh, because this doesn't work. Um, you might think of saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have multiple database servers, so each app server has its own database server. That should work, right? That should work. That should work just fine. Um, the problem is this load balancer is going to give you to a pretty much a random application server, right? So I might make a request to add a picture of a burrito, and that will get routed to app server one, let's say. And that might get stored in app server one's database server. Okay, well, now I realize I, I didn't like that picture as much as I thought I did. I want to edit it. Um, so I, I submit an edit and the load balancer says, okay, well, that's going to go to app server three because that's the one that should get the next request. I says, so cool. All right, well, I need to do a query to update uh, image 43 and it, and it checks in the database and two things can happen here. Well, number one is not the right database. So my picture of the burrito I put in here in database server one is not in database server three. So that's the first thing that's going to be a problem. So either it's not going to find the thing that I'm looking for and it's going to error out and the user will see an error message, or I'm going to update somebody else's picture of a burrito. And then now we've got serious problems and we've got some unhappy customers. So this doesn't really work. Uh, there are ways of sort of uh, horizontally scaling our database. But this approach, which you sort of think of naturally, is not the right one. The correct approach with scaling a database horizontally 
is the process of partitioning or sharding that database. So think about a customer database where you'd have all sorts of different companies inside of that database. It's a very large database. It's starting to have issues because there's so many rows in some of these tables. You can say, fine, well, customer D doesn't need to interact with customer X's data and vice versa and, and all of this. So why can't we take our data and we'll take the customer specific stuff and we're gonna split it into a couple different mini servers. Could be any number. I, I have three here because this is a nice and complete number. Um, but you take your, your large database and you partition it into three or four or five or whatever your, your number is of smaller databases. And each, all the records related to, to some distinct entity uh, such as a major customer or a couple of major customers go into one database. And then records related to a couple other major customers go into another database. And records related to all your minor customers, they might go into yet another database. And so now whenever a request comes in, the server routes it to the appropriate database given that customer. And typically you'll need another small uh, database to figure out which one of these larger databases to talk to. So that's sort of the idea of, of partitioning or sharding uh, your database. This can be a pain though. Um, you got to do it right and you don't get a whole lot of shots at this. So this can actually eat up a lot of your engineering time as well, but it tends to fix those problems. What happens if all of your customers names start with A? Well, you find something else. <laughs> uh, so maybe you say customer ID 1 to 100 goes in this database and 101 to 200 goes in that database, something like that. So some unique thing that you can point to. It doesn't, it, it can be whatever you want it to be. You call that a, a partition key. Could you copy all the data across to each of the database servers instead of partitioning? Well, like, you, uh, replicas? Yeah, we'll, talk, we'll talk about okay. that in a bit. Yeah. We, we got a question, so I want to make sure that it's on the list. Well, I, I, I love it. I love it. This is this is almost a, a beta of this talk, as, as you will. So I, I love to see the stuff that, that you want me to include, because uh, thankfully, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting all, all the check marks that, that, that we want to hit. So that's good. Uh, all right, so let's let's talk about uh, NoSQL because that was a wonderful question earlier. I like that. Um, so with NoSQL databases, I, I don't like the <laughs> the phrase NoSQL, uh, but uh, it refers to like a non-relational database. You don't have your normal SQL queries with your joins, etc. You get about four different types of NoSQL databases. Um, you would you could have a key value database. Um, which is sort of like a, a dictionary or a map, depending on your programming language of choice, uh, that has a key and, and a value. It's very quick for looking up uh, data, uh, and that data can be very loose as to as far as whatever is stored in it. Um, you can have your document databases, which is kind of like a MongoDB, where you have sort of a, a an unstructured or semi-structured piece of data. Uh, where you're putting a, a JSON into your database, um, and you can pull that data out by by some identifier. Uh, these typically support like some 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 light querying capabilities, but being, maybe not as detailed as as uh, SQL Server. Um, there's column oriented databases, which uh, are are sort of like a tag related type of thing. So um, think about maybe a database full of products. You might have uh, you might have books have things like auth attributes like authors and uh, page count and things like that uh, versus electronics might have um, attributes related to requires batteries and uh, uh, so maybe some regulatory information. Uh, so column oriented, -oriented uh, databases are very good for just things that you they'd have a structure, but you want to be able to add on little things to them. And then graph databases are, are really kind of for almost social applications. So think about uh, LinkedIn, where your graph nodes would be like a person in your network. Uh, and you'd have these edges between nodes saying that, oh, well, uh, Matt Elon knows uh, Katie Zyko. Uh, and then she knows, you know, such and such. And you'd have all these different relationships in your database. Uh, and each node would have like a little bit of, of data associated with the JSON, et cetera. Um, 
And so these graph databases are really good for sort of really social webs of, of, of things. So, but the advantages of these NoSQL databases are that they tend to be a little bit more uh, horizontally scalable by default compared to your larger uh, relational database management systems. Uh, so these tend to get around uh, the scalability limits or the horizontal scalability limits of your uh, larger uh, uh, SQL databases. The trade-offs are you don't get as, as good of querying capabilities typically um, or indexing or things like that, but they do tend to work better at larger and larger scales, uh, which is why most of them were tended to be invented uh, from my understanding. All right, so let's move past databases. We'll revisit it for replication a little bit later. Um, but uh, our lovely Beredit continues to grow uh, and they're hoping that they'll eventually see some money, but the venture capitalists really like burritos and so they're happy about it. Um, and so they're starting to, they're, they're, their database is happy, their application is happy, but they're feeling like they, they're having to focus a lot more on performance than they'd like. And so they're starting to look at their APIs and see, well, what can we do better with our APIs? Is there something we can do differently with our APIs to help reduce uh, our need to focus as much on performance? And so it's kind of a different, uh, different sort of a, a concept here. But I want to talk about APIs because they're, I think they're important for, for performance uh, and scalability purposes. So I like to think about AP, APIs or, sorry, uh, API was an application performance uh, application programming interface, it's sort of like how something interacts with your code. I like to explain it to our students as sort of like a drive through where you have a menu of things that you can do. And then you make a request for uh, five boxes of chicken and a, uh, a large soda. And then you're either going to get your chicken or they're going to say, sir, this, this is a Taco Bell. Um, one well, of those kinds of things. But APIs, when they're not done correctly, they can put a lot more stress onto your system. And I think it's worth talking about that because it can really um, contribute a lot to uh, how much you need to focus on scaling your applications. So with, uh, with applications, you might get a request all the, uh, for like, hey, um, Beretta might get a request for, give me a list of, of uh, burritos pictures or something like that. And in a normal system, it's going to go through and it's going to say, hey, all right, I'm going to talk to the, the server, say, give me a list of burritos. That's going to say, okay, well, I'm going to query the database, get a list of burritos. I'm going to return it back and I'm going to send it on to you. And now the next person comes along and say, okay, I want a list of burritos. Give me that. And so each request is coming in and it's putting additional strain on the database server, additional strain on the app server. And it's, it's, it's starting to add up over time. And this is kind of a common request that you might think uh, on a burrito related website in our case. So one of the things you can do is you can add caching and caching is basically once you, if you know, uh, if you know uh, uh, what you're requesting, you can store it in memory or on some special cache like, uh, like Redis and it's gonna persist that for a while. And so think about my request for the list of burritos. It's gonna go out, grab a list of burritos, and it's gonna say, okay, well, you asked me for burritos, I'm gonna put them in the cache. And so it's gonna say, okay, save this list of burritos for an hour. And then the next person comes along and say, hey, I wanna see the number, uh, see, see the, the current burritos. It's gonna ask the cache, hey, do you know about the, the current list of burritos? Is it still valid? Have we passed that time yet? It's like, oh yeah, I do know about that. I've got them right here. Here you go. It's not even gonna to go to the database. So that request, doesn't put any strain at all on your database server. And in fact, it puts a little bit less strain on your application server because the request comes and goes really quickly because it doesn't have to wait for the response to come back. Um, and then the next request comes in and let's say we've now passed our, the, 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 the thing, the, the burrito list and the cache has expired. And so it says, oh, well, that's no good. I'm gonna remove it from the cache and I'm gonna query the database server again and get it back. I'm gonna put it back in the cache and I'm gonna give back the, the list of burritos. So this, this kind of caching solution really does uh, reduce the amount of stress that you might find uh, your application under. Can you write data to the cache? And what happens if it's expired? Like, so you have new data, it gets the TTL, which is time to live, mm -hmm. expires and it didn't make it to the database. And actually, how does it get to the database from the cache? Um, 
I uh, most of the work I've done with caching has been caching the value back from the from from the from the database and not putting data directly into the cache and then putting it from the cache to the database. So Alicia, you're, I think you're at your knowledge on this might be more advanced than mine. Uh, so I would love your answer on that. I'm, I'm taking the AWS certification for oh. architects. So uh, this is all in my head right now. Um, so most commonly you have a read only cache and a write through. Write through means that any put requests you'll send directly to the database. And then you read requests, go to the cache. You mm. can have caches um, that write and then usually have something called a dirty bit. Um, and if the dirty bit's on, it means you have to take this data and push it to the database server. Often the cache implementations will do that for you. Um, fun stuff. That's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm studying for the Azure developer certification and caching is on the menu, but I haven't gotten to that part yet. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from my experience thus far, um, which is always limited in some, some areas. So I like that. I learned something new tonight. That was awesome. Um, but I think I covered most most of caching. Uh, the, the other aspect of it, it, it can be difficult to work with a cache. Um, if you get an update operation, like we're, we're updating a picture of a burrito or whatever, we need to make sure that the value in that cache gets uh, updated or cleared out. So the next the next request comes in and gets the, the correct list, uh, the correct uh, the correct data. Uh, so caches can can save you a lot of uh, of performance woes, but they also add a lot of complexity uh, to your application and can result in more bugs uh, in your application because you now have to worry about is your cache does it contain the right valid uh, the right valid information? Uh, if we have multiple app servers going on, are they all talking to the same cache? And if not, how are they coordinating with between each other? Uh, so we have a lot more problems that we have to work through but it's ultimately worth it to get to a certain scale uh, because it keeps us from having to to repartition our database all the time or, or focus on some of, some of these more advanced concepts there. Um, another one, I, I, I mentioned this because I've seen it destroy uh, startups before, but imagine you have a web page and it has like a, a little bell kind of notification in, in, the, in the top uh, top corner. So whenever you get new notifications, you want it to show a little red one saying, oh, I've got a new notification. Somebody liked my burrito picture or whatever it might be. One of the, the easiest ways of implementing this as a startup is to do something called polling. With polling, your client application uh, makes a request to the server. It says, hey, do you have any notifications for me? Server says, no, I don't, I, nothing, nothing for you. And then maybe 15 seconds later, it says, okay, how about now? Nope, no notifications for you. How about now? You know, every 15 seconds we're making a request to the server. And at some point, somebody likes our burrito picture because yay. Um, and we make our request and we say, hey, got any, anything for me? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, here you go. Here's your information. This works. This is fairly easy to implement, uh, but it, does, it, it sort of falls apart at scale because uh, we were just talking about browser tabs earlier. People leave their browser tabs open and if you're not using an application and it's checking for notifications every 15 seconds or whatever it might be, well, you're now putting additional load on the on the computer, um, or sorry, on the server, when you might not even be around to see that notification pop up, even if it's present. And people leave their desktops open and unlocked all night. And so you, it's not just one user, it's a hundred users, and they're all sending requests every 15 seconds to see, hey, you got anything new for me? And so that that tends to add up. And these these operations here typically require a lot of database operations to say, okay, is there any new likes? Are there any new comments? Are there any new emails or whatever it might be, right? So polling uh, can actually be pretty disastrous for organizations at a larger scale. The so one of the solutions for this is to have some sort of a subscription model where instead of polling, we will say, hey, I'm here, I'm connected, I'm on your homepage. When you have any new notifications for me, send them my way. And you might do something using WebSockets with a technology like SignalR or some sort of a push notification. And you sort of have this, this sort of connection going on. And as those notifications happen, or as those events happen, it says, oh, well, this event is for client four. Oh, yeah, they're connected right now. Hey, here you go. And it sends it directly over. You don't have that constant polling going on. You don't have that, that constant drain on the, on the server going on. You do have an open connection, 
but it's less drain on the server than uh, than a constant pull, 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 pull. I've been in startups that have been actually just horrifically hurt by this approach. Uh, and it's amazing uh, the, the kind of difference that this can do for your web server. Uh, but it does take some engineering to get this right, which is why you don't typically do this to begin with. Um, so it's sort of the circle of life, I suppose. Um, another problem I, I see is we tend to want to make our REST web services or other types of web services very granular in nature. So we'd have really small web services like, hey, I'd like to get uh, a list of projects. I'd like to get a list of users. I'd like to get my current task assignments or something like that. And so you'd have a lot of these little small things. And we love small methods as developers. We, we're supposed to make small, uh, small methods as developers. Less lines of code is good, right? Really cohesive little things is good, right? Well, problem is each one of these little requests that we might have to make to, to, to show a user interface, we have some, some expenses we have to pay for that in terms of performance, in terms of system uh, behavior, et cetera. So if we're making a REST call, for example, we have to wait for the network uh, activity to go through. So we have to serialize a request to, to try JSON or XML or something else. It has to go across the network cables to whatever server it's trying to talk to. That server has to handle it, it has to deserialize the request, has to handle it, has to serialize a request back, the res or response back, that response has to get back to us, and then we have to move on to the next thing. And you do this for a lot of little web service calls, and it really adds up. And sure, you can maybe do some of these things uh, in parallel if you start getting into asynchronous programming, but now you got a little bit more complexity to manage for your application and any one of these calls can fail. So one of the ways that I've seen applications have actual, you know, pretty bad performance is because developers treat web service methods like they're like they're instant and they're really not. And you do have risk associated with each one and you do have performance penalties associated with each one. It, and, and your brain doesn't want to work this way as a developer, but sometimes it's a lot better to think about uh, making a couple small, very cohesive methods that might return a little bit more. Um, and so we, it might make a little bit more sense to give you a method to say, hey, give me all the data related to my projects and give me all the data related to my teams. And sure, each, each one of these requests might be a little bit longer to handle on the server, but you have less risk going on. You're paying the penalties of your network traffic and your serialization to deserialization fewer times there's less risk that something's gonna go wrong. Your code is less complex to make the calls and, and handle the responses. Um, so yeah, it could be fine to have all these little small endpoints, but you can also gain a lot of benefits from adding some specialized um, task oriented things. Why uh, if don't we you just like horizontally scale? Like let's just add a hundred, a thousand hosts. Why would that, um, what, what downsides would that have? Well, you still have to talk to them all, right? Like your, your client application still has to make the request to all of them. I, I'm not sure I'm following the question, Alicia. Oh no, it's more like, what if we just add a whole bunch? It doesn't matter how many requests you make, um, but it would be costly yep. and your code would still be complicated, right? Yeah, your code's complicated. You know, I've, I've seen, like even if the server's in the same building, you still have, this is a lot of delay. You know, you put a, prof, a performance profiler on this, you're, you're paying for this a lot more than you think you are as a developer. Um, especially if you're doing XML, because, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, if we have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit more about GraphQL, uh, which is a sort of a specialized query language um, for uh, web communication where you can say, hey, I want, uh, I want my projects and also any tasks assigned to them and also things like that. So almost like writing a SQL query for a web service. Uh, and that can give you maybe a more elegant way of doing this kind of a thing. Uh, that makes you want to th throw up a little bit less because as a developer, I really want to do this, this thing over here with all these small calls, but it's really not good for performance. Um, at least on the client side. Uh, okay, uh, I can't talk about web services without talking about rate limiting. Uh, rate limiting is when you say that only, you're only gonna allow a certain number of requests from a given user or a given IP address in a second or a minute or some arbitrary period of time. Um, in my experience, you need to introduce rate limiting sooner than you think you do. Um, 
because users are creative. They're innovative. Sometimes they're malicious, but more often than not, they're trying to get something and they're, they, they saw that you had an API and they're, they're trying to build something because they like what you're doing. And with, when you introduce rate limiting, the, you, know, you might have a few requests coming over in, in, in a second. And the first one's going to be fine. And the second one's going to be fine. But as soon as you exceed the amount that your IP address or your user token is allowed to make in that, in that period of time, the server will spit back an error message. It'll say, hey, too many requests. You need to, you need to chill out. Uh, and the user might see an error message or their, their script might see an error message, but that's better than the alternative. Uh, let me describe to you the, the, the alternative. <laughs> um, I worked in a, in a project management uh, industry for, for quite some time. And we had a lovely little dashboard that had all these uh, charts that you could see to see all the status of your work items, your tickets, et cetera. Uh, it was beautiful. People loved it. They loved to put it on the hallways and see like, hey, here's how our, how our team is doing, you know? Um, but it didn't refresh. And so some users said, hey, I'm going to write a browser plugin that's going to automatically refresh the page. But they didn't write their code right. Um, they messed up a little bit on the JavaScript. And they omitted, or they set it to zero, uh, the parameter that's had the interval to refresh. And so effectively, their browser was instructing itself to make as many requests as it possibly could to our web server in a given second. And this has had the request that had the effect of our server didn't have rate limiting. And so therefore, when it got the requests, it queried all of these tables and did all these expensive calculations. And it tried to keep up with this flood of requests coming its way. And eventually, it stopped being able to respond at all, not just to this user, but to every other user of the system. And so you need this sort of a, a, a rate limiting kind of a, a, an approach in order to have a circuit breaker in your application. Uh, otherwise, somebody's either going to attack you or make a mistake, like, like that little story I just illustrated. And it's going to bring down your system until you can figure out what IP address it's coming from, block it, etc. cetera. Um, so that's sort of a denial of service attack kind of a thing. Uh, you said that it's, is it user-based? You said like a user token. So does that mean a cookie? Well, it could be a header. It could be any number of things based on what you're doing with your application. Often organizations require you to have an API key if you're working with an API. So I think an API key is usually the, the most common thing you'll see is in a header of a web request. Um, and some, uh, some hosting providers uh, will also give you uh, automatic ability to mitigate uh, distributed denial of service attacks, which may reduce your need to have something like this yourself. Um, and I believe a lot of them have uh, API management solutions all uh, as well, which gives you this out of the box. You have to pay for it, but you know, it's nice. <clears throat> but uh, it's important and you need, this. you need it sooner than you think you do. So our lovely uh, apocryphal uh, Reddit it just keeps on growing. And now we have a lovely server that's a, a suite of servers that's able to handle things. We've got a partition database or a NoSQL database or some combination of the two. We're able to handle everything. The APIs have been optimized. And so we're able to keep up with the requests coming in. And uh, everything's good, except when Beretta catches on overseas. And so now users across the world are starting to use this thing and they're starting to have some problems. And so let's talk about scaling the front end. We're not going to spend as much time on this, but it's important to touch on the subject. So when we're talking about the front end and scalability, we're usually talking about something a little bit different than when we're talking about with the back end and the database and the APIs and things like that. And with that, we're talking about latency. So this is the time needed to talk to our server. So let's say we're hosting our application in the Western United States. So we've got a, a, a server going on over here that has some static HTML and CSS, et cetera. Well, users on the West Coast are having a good time and even users in Indiana or uh, towards the East Coast are doing okay. Um, but you start using this from India or Australia or China uh, or even the UK, you know, you're paying a lot more for that transit time. So when it's trying to load the HTML and the CSS and the JavaScript, it, it, you, you have to wait for that. And for every page navigation, you have to pay for that. And so we start to have more and more of this latency problem. So front end optimizations tend to be around reducing this. 
Uh, first thing that most organizations do is they'll minify their code. So you might have your JavaScript or your CSS or your HTML. And as you're getting ready to deploy to production, some, some automated tool, usually something in Webpack or something similar, is going to uh, minify your code. So here we have my function. And the minifier has taken this and renamed all the variables it can and removed all the spaces it can and, and the line breaks. And this is actually now um, you know, slightly smaller to download. And the, the, the little size different difference matters in terms of performance. Um, and so this is, again, this is not the code that you're maintaining. You're maintaining this code, but something automated, some automated tool will minify your code down to something small like this. And so this adds up in a larger application, particularly a single page JavaScript application, where you have a, some pretty big uh, JavaScript files, the CSS files. Uh, it, it gets minified down to something small and that reduces the amount of waiting that people have to do. Second thing people will do is they'll bundle the, their files. So not everything is going to be going into a single large JavaScript file or even a single large CSS file. Instead, you'll have maybe a subset of files. So if, if you need some common JavaScript for all your pages, you might have a common .min .javascript. And if your products related pages have, a, have some JavaScript needs of their own, then they might have a separate bundle. And your home page doesn't necessarily need to talk to the products uh, bundle. And so you, you, you can start to, to partition out your code into these little small bundles and you only get the ones that you need. And if we're going in, if we're looking at our products page and we navigate from, pro, we get navigate to products, it says, okay, well, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna get common and I'm gonna get products. And now I'm gonna click on a product. And I'm gonna go to product details. Product details says, okay, well, it says I need common and, and products, but I already have those. So I'm good. So the next time I need to, to download another, uh, another file is when I start to move into another area of my application. So that's, that's the idea of bundling. Uh, but the most impactful thing you can do on the client side is to use content delivery networks or CDNs. And CDNs will, uh, there's, there's sort of like a, a, a clone of the files on your server, but they're uh, geolocated. So you might have a CDN is uh, near clusters of your users and they're throughout the world. And as you publish new files, these files will slowly make their way to the other content delivery uh, network nodes. And then as people are navigating to your page, they're not navigating to your main server anymore. They're grabbing it from the nearest CDN uh, location to them. And so this sort of an approach really reduces the penalties for, uh, for latency even further. Um, that's about the extent I want to talk about front end today because it's not as critical in my experience um, because it's running in your browser instead of on, a, on some server out there. Uh, but let's talk about some, some, some final advanced topics uh, just, just as we're, we're, we're closing today. <coughs> so revisiting the database, talking specifically about relational database management uh, uh, software like a SQL Server or uh, MySQL, MariaDB, things like that. Uh, they have this idea of a lock, and that what, what that is is when you're making a query to update a row in a database, it's going to have some sort of an exclusive lock on either uh, a row or uh, a table or a page of data within that table, or maybe even on the entire database itself. And while it's got that lock, nothing else can try to acquire that lock. They have to wait. So even if you have a database server that's able to handle, let's say a thousand requests a second, um, if your queries are running and they have to wait for those locks, it's still gonna take a while. And so those requests will start to, to, to delay and delay and delay. And if you, you can get into some really crazy scenarios where you start to have deadlocks with one thing holding onto one lock and another thing holding onto one lock and they both kind of need each other's. Um, a little bit beyond the scope of today's talk, but we have some, some issues with, with locking. Uh, so, so database locking is one of those things that can really impact database performance. Uh, and the, the lovely topic of a read replica, which uh, Alicia helpfully mentioned earlier, uh, helps reduce the risk of that. And a read replica is basically where you have your primary database. That's the one that you're still writing to, right? So we're, we're, we're making our updates to our primary database and then those updates will 
pretty quickly synchronized to what's called a read replica. And the read replica is, is a clone of that database, but it's read only. And so things that don't need to, to write to that database can actually query against your read replica and get the data back. Uh, and that, well, the, the nice thing about this is that we don't have to wait for, for a whole lot of locks to go on at all because we're just reading from things. We're also not sending that traffic to the primary database, which reduces the load on that database as well. Um, this plays nicely with kind of this, this newer trend uh, of, <laughs> I always hate saying this one um, because it's a mouthful, but uh, CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Oh my gosh, could we find a better name? Um, it is a nice name, it's an appropriate name, it's just hard to say. With CQRS, uh, we are sort of segregating our application into two different silos. So we have logic related to writing to the database, and that's what's talking to the database. And we have logic related to querying the database, and that might work with a read replica or work with the primary database. And the CQRS is definitely worth checking out if you're looking into higher performance with a kind of a SQL server uh, or, or a SQL database. Um, but it really follows, it plays well with the read replica as well. Uh, there's something that we don't have a lot of time to talk about today um, called event sourcing that also can play really well with this as well. So if you want to check that out, I would recommend that. Uh, just some newer developments in database technology and how you approach those. Um, Let's talk about domain-driven design. So domain-driven design is sort of built, built around looking at your, uh, at your data. And you want to try to take your, your pieces of data and identify little groupings of them or large groupings of them. We call those uh, contexts or bounded contexts or, and you'd have this, this kind of this aggregate root here. So you might have like a, a group of logic around your customers and maybe a group of logic around your products. And you, you can take the, these, these little silos, if you will, and you can write your logic or your application logic around them. That's sort of the approach of domain-driven design. Um, the implications of this as far as database technologies are, are pretty good though, because you can say, well, wait a minute, why do I have to store all this stuff in the same database with all this stuff? And it gives you a, a, an opportunity to sort of partition your data based on the context. So you might have a customer database or a products database and this kind of a thing. And so you can take your, your data and sort of scale it out a little bit more. Um, and this reduces your need for horizontal partitioning or it gives you a different model for horizontal partitioning might be a better word. Um, and then if you need to tweak your data, maybe you can take your customer database and make it a document database down the road instead of a, a relational database. And maybe your products database might be, a, uh, I don't know, a column database. Uh, but you can start to structure your data a little bit different uh, to, to make sense for the given context. We can take this, this sort of an idea of, of splitting our database into, into other databases by other context, and we can kind of evolve it a little bit further and say, well, wait a minute, I've got this customer logic here, and I've got this product logic here, and my web application why do I have to uh, update the same application if my customer logic changes when my product logic didn't? Why can't I just separate this out into two different web applications? And so you, you take your code and you split it in half, and now you can update your customers separately than your products. And you can have one team maintaining your product service and one team maintaining your customer service. And you start to look at this and you say, well, I can really take this idea and I can push it off elsewhere in my application. And you start to wind up with something, you know, we're calling microservices, where you have these little contexts. You say, hey, I got an application service. I got an authentication service. It's got its own database. I got a billing service. I got a logging service. I got an inventory service. I got all these little services. This is pretty cool. And I can scale each one of these up or out as I need to. I can write one in Java and another in Node.js. I can do whatever I want to with these applications. Um, and you can kind of give them to different teams and, and the like. And so microservices is a way of taking your logic and sort of scaling it, scaling it up even more as you have different teams working on things and you have these, these different, um, uh, different scalability models and different technologies for each one. Uh, and so it's, it's gotten pretty popular over the last, uh, last few years for sure. 
uh, but it has some drawbacks. Um, it's, it's really, really good if you want to go really big, but you, you have to pay for that. And there's a cost. And part of that cost is understanding your whole system because you need somebody who's, who's going to be able to understand what all of these things are doing. And there's kind of inherently a lot of finger pointing um, between teams or between applications when things aren't working quite right. And so that can make debugging a lot harder. And so you start to need a lot more uh, maturity in terms of monitoring, debugging, uh, and things like that. Uh, you also need to start worrying about reliability a lot more. So any one of these things could be offline at any one point. You're, you, you might have networking issues preventing services from talking to each other. Um, you know, what happens when your application service can talk to the billing service, but it can't uh, to process an order, but it can't modify the inventory service at the same time? Uh, you know, how does your system handle this? And usually you have things like queues and a lot of more event event oriented logic and res, uh, redundancy and stuff like that to, to handle that kind of a thing. But these are problems that you need to start thinking about. And so once you get into the, the, the technologies of microservices, you have all these problems you need to solve and there are solutions for all of them. But when you're focusing on solving these solutions, you're less focused on adding features and meeting customer needs and more focused on the things you need to do to make the application work at this scale. So um, that, that's kind of a cautionary note for, for me is don't go too big too quickly because you don't usually need this level of complexity uh, until you really need it. <laughs> um, another, another complication with, with this is you need a certain level of maturity for updating things. So if we're adding a new feature and our we need to update the application service and the authentication service and the billing service and the billing database. What happens if the feature rollout doesn't go well? How can we roll back? Can we roll back the data to the data to the database here? Does this guy have to roll back, et cetera? So you, you need a little bit more maturity with your deployment, with automation and everything else. Uh, it's awesome once it works, but you have to pay for it and you have to pay for it in terms of maintenance and automation and all these things. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's conclude here. So our burritos are now working fine at scale. Uh, we've got burrito related microservices. Um, Six billion people throughout the, the world are using our application daily for some reason or another. I can't figure out why. Um, and let's just uh, let's just talk about some final words of warning here. Um, first of all, it can be really tempting to play with all of these things but most of these things have costs associated with them. So if you're working on these with a side project or in your day job, you know, pay attention to the mechanisms that you have to see, especially if you're doing this cloud hosting, to see what this is costing you. Um, I had a student last cohort who was really, really, really interested in cloud computing and uh, he picked the wrong database and he wound up uh, with a $300 database bill at the end of a, of a month. And thankfully, uh, uh, Azure was very uh, kind and lenient to him and, and actually waived the database fee, but I was not expecting them to do that. So you need to be really careful and use the, the monitoring and uh, the, the price monitoring and uh, safeguards that these, these systems give you um, when, if you're going to go down this road because you can be, get stuck with a, with a bill if you leave a virtual machine on or something like that. Um, secondly, you and I've been talking about this for the last bit here, you need to be very aware of when you need to scale. Uh, my advice to you is that you want to scale once you start seeing those early warning signs uh, as, you're, as you're building your application. So scale up a little bit and then keep your eye on the metrics from that point on and see, okay, well, what's my average uh, response time? Is it trending up or down? What's my usage level? Is it trending up or down? At what point do we think that we're gonna need to upgrade again and let's start planning on work for supporting that level of scalability now so that when it happens, it's not an urgent fire. Um, the caveat to that is that if you are a large bank and you, are, you have a lot of, uh, of users of your applications already and you're launching a brand new application, the odds are you're probably getting a significant amount of users early on. And in the case where you're gonna get a lot of new users or a lot of usage for a new application, that's when you need to care about scaling right right off the bat. Otherwise, watch your usage numbers and just go with what you really need. Because all of these things that we've talked about can serve your needs 
It's just at a different scale and a different organizational size and a different maturity level. Um, simple is fine. Simple works just fine. Stick with simple until you have a good reason not to. Um, so just to recap my, my recommendations, uh, early stage, scale your, your server up a little bit, vertically scale your server, your web server. Uh, go with minification and bundling early on because they're, they're cheap and easy ways of improving the user experience. Uh, once you start uh, getting into to database issues, start optimizing your queries, the ones that are the slowest. Uh, and then once you start taking off a little bit more, you need to add rate limiting uh, before you think you do. You need to, to start looking at horizontal scaling instead of vertical scaling. You need to start looking at caching and, uh, and, and the issues that I have, at least in some critical areas, the areas that are most overloaded in the database, I would say. And you need to start having a plan for how you're going to handle the advanced growth, whether that's using NoSQL, microservices, something else. At the advanced stages, well, that's when we start to get into the advanced concepts and automation, microservices, NoSQL. You can use NoSQL before that, that's fine. But you need to have a plan for handling your database and handling your larger scale growth. Uh, I know I gave you a lot of concepts at once today. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can read uh, just with more information. Some, some key uh, recommendations for you would be uh, Foundation Fundamentals of Software Architecture. I really like this book, but actually everything from the uh, White O'Reilly series is really, really good. They have a lot of newer architectural books out there that are pretty good. So definitely recommend those kinds of things if you're looking for really specifics on things, but this book here is, is really good on, on uh, just the general uh, aspects. Uh, web scalability for startup engineers is really good. It's a lot of the stuff from this talk in a lot more deep depth. I haven't read a whole lot of it yet, but it's, it, it's very good from everything I've looked at. Uh, and finally, my, my reason for giving this talk is that there's a lot of good books out there, but there's not a lot of great books for beginners. And so I am working on uh, making my own a uh, new developer's guide to application scalability. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in, I'm hoping to release it in the fall. Uh, I got the URL down there in the lower right, newdevsguide.com. Uh, um, I'm very interested in anything that you that I didn't cover today or uh, that you might be interested in more depth. Um, so please let me know, send me an email, hit, uh, hit, hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'd love to hear what you're curious about. Um, and finally, I'd like to ask you to, to keep uh, Tech Elevator in mind. If you are looking to learn about software engineering, or if you know some friends who are, or if you're looking to hire some new engineers, um, it, we, we are always uh, enrolling new students. We are always graduating new students. I have uh, Katie Zyko here in chat, uh, who's you know, happy to talk to you more. I have her email here. Katie, I don't know if you want to say a quick word or not. Yeah, wow, I'm just, I'm so amazed, Matt. You're so, you're amazing. I, I was, I don't know a lot about, you know, what's what's going on um, in terms of exactly what you're referring to, because, you know, I'm not a software developer, but wow, you are just, you're so engaging. Um, so thank you for sharing all your tips tonight. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Katie. I'm the campus director here in Philadelphia. If you have some questions about Tech Elevator, I'd be happy to, to answer those. My email is right there, but thanks, Matt. This has been wonderful. Mm, thank you. Um, this is here's my contact information for anyone who wanted to get a hold of me. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, any closing questions, any closing comments, uh, anything that uh, I didn't cover that you wish I did. And Alicia, thank you for chiming in. I loved your comments. I learned some new things tonight. No problem. I, I try to keep conversations going. Um, well, yeah, well, you, you know a lot more about, about, about a number of these things than I do. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, you don't want to know what's on the AWS exams. Um, uh, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to stop the cloud recording. Um, so just so everyone knows, that's uh, the last bit.